Thank you very much. Welcome to the Board of County Commissioners Budget Workshop for Fiscal Year 2024 Proposed Budget on June 13, 2023. Madam Clerk, may we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Barnett? Here. Commissioner Baxter? Here. Commissioner Bernard? Here. Commissioner Marino? Here. Vice Mayor Sachs? Here. Mayor Weiss? Here. Commissioner Woodward? Here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna give the vice mayor a second uh, because we're going to ask her to lead us in our invocation and pledge of allegiance. So if you're able to please rise. Dear God, we are thankful for this day that you've given us for its blessings, its opportunities, its challenges. We pray for strength and guidance for each day as it comes to us, for each day's duties, for each day's problems. May we be challenged to give our best always, and may we be assured of your presence with us, and if I may, dear Lord, be with the Panthers tonight. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That was funny. That was very funny. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much, Vice Mayor, and my sentiments for the Panthers as well. Um, all right. Before we get started, just a reminder, if you, uh, we are, of course, going to have public comment uh, this uh, afternoon on our budget so if you have not filled out a comment card i'm encouraging you to please do so we'll give us a a little bit more time and then at some point we'll cut i'll cut this off probably in about the next 15 minutes if anybody needs assistance in filling out a comment card uh, please let our staff know we'd be happy to make sure anybody gets any assistance they might need all right with that i will uh recognize uh our county administrator, Virginia Baker, to take us uh, through the overview of the fiscal year 2024 budget. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the board. Um, this afternoon, we are here to present my 2024 proposed budget. I have with me Sherry Brown, our Director of Office of Financial Management and Budget, and Alicia, uh, it, who's our Assistant Budget Director. Our Budget Director um, could not be with us today. So uh, we're filling in, and <laughs> she's our detailed person. But uh, we do keep her and her family in our prayers. So uh, what I am presenting is a budget in which our goal is to produce a county budget that delivers necessary services while minimizing Avalorum tax requirements. Uh, the countywide budget is balanced at the current rate of 4.1750 mills. Uh, the proposed rate will generate roughly about $1.3 billion in property taxes and $157.6 million over the current year which is about a 13.1% increase. Property taxes uh, make up approximately 62.5% of our total revenues within the general fund. Major revenues increased by 34.1 million over the current year and over the revenue increases, which total roughly about 89 million. Most of this increase was related to fund balance. Uh, these revenues are needed uh, for a number of changes. I will start with our presentation. Uh, we start our budget year uh, back in November. Uh, we sat with the board. We did our budget strategic workshop back in November of 2022. Our initial budget workshop is today. And then we'll come back to the board on July 11th asking you to set the millage rate. And that's the final millage rate where you cannot increase it, you can decrease it, but you can't increase it once you set it in July. We'll hold our first public hearing on September 7th at 5.05 p.m. 
and our second public hearing, which will be the adoption of the budget um, on September 26th, 5.05 p.m. When we met with you uh, back in November and you set your strategic priorities, you set them for economic development, housing and homelessness, environmental protection, infrastructure, substance use and behavior disorder, as well as public safety. In our Avalorum funding uh, highlights based upon your strategic priorities, we look at economic development. We placed in there roughly about 4.3 million. Uh, that does not include staff costs associated with implementing and monitoring and carrying out the projects. Our housing and homelessness, we listed a couple. Uh, I did add another five million in uh, out of Avalorum dollars for housing because it gives us a little more flexibility. We are looking and working with our business industries so that we can continue to increase the number of affordable workforce units within the county. Uh, then we have our non-congregate shelters. Uh, the Glaze is at 2.9 and the homeless resource centers, which we have to, uh, are roughly 12.5. In addition, we've got our environmental protection, four million for natural areas, manatee protection, 750,000. Infrastructure, 84.6 million. Palm train vehicles to be replaced, 79.7 million. Then we also have substance use and behavior disorders. That's our addiction stabilization, a million. Uh, and that carries forward from a number of other prior years working with our partners within the community. We have our recovery support, FAAs increased by 3%, 6.3 million, and our CBAs, our community-based assistant um, agencies, 2.1 million. And then we have our public safety, which is the sheriff, uh, and that's a net budget. It, it uh, accounts for the proposed revenues that the sheriff will be bringing in, uh, along with animal care and control, emergency management, and victim services. Some major assumptions and factors that we considered when putting this budget together. Uh, the countywide budget is balanced, as I stated earlier, based upon our current rate of 4.7150. This will be the second year uh, that this particular millage rate will be utilized. Again, it, the proposed rate will generate 1.361 billion, a 13.1% increase as of the last information we received on June 1st. We will have a final number come July 1, and these, these numbers will more than likely change. We have in here and across the board of roughly about a 6%, uh, and then we have FRS increases that we add an additional $5 million because the state increased the FRS rate over and above what we normally um, budget. Our supplemental funding was $10 million. Uh, that includes 23 Avalorum funded positions and 44 non Avalorum funded positions. We have our sheriff. His total expense budget is 877 million. However, he anticipates bringing in roughly about 99.5 million in revenue, and so therefore his net budget increase was 53 million uh, over 23. Our capital project funding. Uh, for fiscal year 24 is 84.6 million, an increase of 25 million over fiscal year 23. This is primarily due to renewal and replacement projects that we have in line and a few new projects that uh, has been in the five-year plan and is coming through fruition. In addition, we have Palm Tram replacement vehicles, which is 3.6 million, and there are other projects funded with non-Avalorum dollars. Fund balance. Uh, just wanted to highlight our fund balance and to um, give you credit uh, with working with staff on making sure that we stayed and maintained our AAA bond rating. Fund balance is a major component of retaining that AAA rating. So as we issue bonds, and we have issued some uh, just recently, those rates have been lower than what you see on the market because we have a AAA bond rating. And our rating agencies are very impressed with our board, staff, 
in the way that we managed our financial resources over the year. There was a time that they were considering downgrading us uh, coming out of the recession. Uh, they did not because they uh, had worked, the staff person that made the argument for us had worked with us over a number of years. And in his committee, he convinced them not to downgrade us. So we have been working with them uh, since I became the county administrator, I did uh, say to them that I've been in the county for a number of years, started in the budget office, have worked with this process, and that we are working to rebuild, and you have allowed us to do that, our reserves as well as our capital plan. They are also very interested in resiliency programs, which you have allowed us to also invest in. So for if you look at this schedule, uh, we are pretty much the lowest uh, percentage when it comes to fund balance. Uh, and the others, are all of these are all triple A rated. They're higher. We want to be around the 35, 36% is where we would like to build our reserves. Because it not only helps us with fund balance, but if we uh, end up with a disaster, we've got funding to help take care of our residents. Uh, if the economy starts to slow, we will have hopefully dollars in reserve that will help us maintain our quality of life here in Palm Beach County until it recovers. And the next slide just simply shows that our GO bonds are AAA rated, our non avalorum bonds. We've got AAA in two, from two of the rating agencies. The one rating agency is a AA plus, and we hope they come along pretty soon to give us our AAA for our non avalorum bonds as well. And then we have our revenue bonds, which is water utilities, and it's kind of unheard of for water utilities to have a AAA bond rating, but we here in Palm Beach County have a AAA bond rating. Our airports are an A plus and an A1 rated and that is also very high grade credit as well. For our 2024 proposed budget, our total revenue sources by category uh, reflects a total budget of 7.6 billion. And that is primarily 41.8% of that amount is made up of fund balance. We've got 24.8% made up of current taxes for the entire budget and then we move on with the other amounts such as interfund transfers charges for services intergovernmental revenues which is grants our half cent sales tax our infrastructure sales tax and then our license and permitting and other taxes make up about 5.2 percent in our 2024 proposed budget total expenses by activity that's the 7.6 billion the bulk of that is in reserves um, which is 22.5 percent uh, public safety makes up 22.1 percent general government makes up 10 percent uh, and then the other numbers that fall fiscal environment makes up 9.6 percent interfund transfers make up about 10.4 percent and then the others are smaller amounts to make up the budget What is the fund? We wanted to ensure that we reminded all of us of what is a fund because we budget by fund. And so our total budget is 7.6 billion. Then we break that out into governmental funds, which includes the general fund, our special revenue funds, debt service, as well as capital funds. Our proprietary funds are our enterprise funds, airport, WUD, and then our internal service funds uh, fill out the rest. And those are risk management and fleet management, which are charged back to the departments that utilize uh, those particular services. Our 2024 proposed budget by fund shows that of that 7.6 billion, 28.6% uh, is general fund. Uh, the 21.4% is special revenue that includes uh, fire rescue, uh, libraries, along with grants and other special revenues. Our capital projects make up 26.4%. Uh, WUD makes up 12.6%, airport 6.5%. Our debt service makes up a little of 1.2 percent. Twenty-eight 
2024 proposed budget for property tax revenue, our total property taxes that are generate, generated is 1.8, 1.9% if we round up. And of that amount, 72% will go to fund countywide operating uh, tax, taxes, which is in the general fund. And that's 1.3 uh, billion. You'll look at this and you'll see the sheriff and other constitutional officers, judicial, financially assisted agencies, BCC departments, other agencies, capital projects and community redevelopment agencies. Uh, we look at fire rescue that makes up 23% along with library and operating voted debt, which is 4.5%. And then our countywide voted debt taxes is 0.3%, um, which is down from last year. We look at our millage rates uh, for countywide. We're at 4.7150 at the moment. And then we've got fire rescue at 3.4581. Uh, and they've been there for uh, quite a few years. Jupiter fire uh, decreased slightly to 1.7951. And then libraries uh, has been at its 0.5491 for a period of time. Our Avalorum taxes, our countywide operating generated 1.2 billion in 23. In 24, we're projecting 1.3 uh, billion. We're looking at a difference of 157 million, a 13.1% increase. Our countywide voted debt is roughly about 7.3 um, million for 23. It was budgeted. For 24, it's 5.4 uh, million. So it's a $1.8 million difference and it decreased by 25.7%. We had some bonds aging and rolling off. We also look at our dependent districts, uh, Palm Beach County Library, uh, which was 77.7 million uh, for 23 and then for 24, 85.3 million for 24, a 9.8% increase. Fire Rescue increased 13.2%, and then Jupiter Fire increased by 7.5% over, over this year. We're looking at a total countywide funds and dependent district of roughly 12.7% increase. In 2024, our proposed budget for general fund revenues by category. The general fund is the fund that the board has the most flexibility in. And that particular budget is roughly about $2.1 billion. We're looking at current property taxes, which make up 62.5% in the general fund, uh, which is $1.3 billion. We're looking at our fund balance, which is $428 million, and that is 19.7% within the general fund. We're looking at our um, intergovernmental revenues, which is 12.5%, it's 271 million, and then charges for services was 48 million. Those are primarily um, the revenues that we generate within the general fund. Our general fund major revenue history, I won't read this, but I uh, wanted to give you some history uh, starting in 19 of what was actually collected in our general revenues. And then what we look at in the uh, proposed difference between uh, 22 actual versus uh, 24 <coughs> proposed, which is your very last column. And so we've got revenues that have been generated uh, and we anticipate in the difference being 22.2 uh, million uh, for major revenues, total major revenues. And then we're also looking at our local option gas tax along with our constitutional gas tax. And that difference was 2.4 million for our total general fund revenues of $24.7 um, million. Our general fund expenses by function for the 2.1 billion, proposed billion, uh, sheriff law enforcement, uh, we're looking at 649 million, and that is roughly about 29.8%. Uh, the sheriff by law does law enforcement. 
The county is charged with corrections and judicial. However, we, we work with the sheriff and he covers those functions for the BCC. And that amount was 228 million, a 10% uh, of that, of the general fund expenses. Combined, that's roughly about 40%. Our BCC departments make up about 23%, and that's 511 million, along with our reserves of 415, and that's 19%. Then we're looking at capital and non-departmental, that's 9.6%, and constitutional, uh, other constitutional officers make up about 5%. Our debt service is roughly about 2.5. And again, I wanted to share with you just some history on our general fund expense report. And that is what we, by the various categories, have expended over the last couple of years, starting in 19 and bringing you current um, to today. So when we look at our budget difference uh, between 23 budget and the 24 proposed budget, we're looking at BCC departments increasing by 6.6%, sheriff increasing by five, other constitutional officers increasing by 17.2%, our debt service decreasing by 4.9%, CRAs increasing by 14.9%, uh, our reserves increasing 59%, and our capital uh, increasing by 43.4%. Non-departmental is roughly about 8.8% for a total of 14.8%. Just a little history on CRAs, and that's what this graph shows you. And the last column on that page uh, reflects what we anticipate paying out to CRAs. We have to write a check right off the top to our CRAs, and that totals roughly about $70.4 million. I also wanted to just kind of give you a graph of our cumulative percentage increase in Avalorum support over the years. We're looking at starting out at 2007 till today. Uh, the green line reflects the sheriff's budget. The blue line reflects the Avalorum funded county departments. The gray, which looks black to me, but it's gray. Uh, it's a little gray. Yeah, a little gray. The, the lightest black uh, reflects the sheriff and the BCC combined uh, budgets. And then our taxable value is the red line. Then when we went to look at population and CPI combined, which is Tabor, that is our black line. And so just wanted to share that information with you. And the next one is just simply reflects a different way of graphing changes in our net operating budget between the BCC and the sheriff. Employees per 1,000 population. Our population is continuing to grow and it is becoming more and more diverse, uh, not only race-wise, gender, ethnicity, uh, age, uh, and so we have to provide services to all of the above. Uh, as you can see, our employees per 1,000 population back in 2008 was pretty good, <laughs> really high. But then when we hit the recession, we significantly reduced the number of positions in the county. We did a lot of that through uh, attrition, but then there were others that we had to, to lay off. And so the population continued to grow, and as you can see, staffing did not, which in also includes the BCC staffing. Uh, we look at um, history uh, for BCC staffing as well. In 1988, uh, the board had four aides, um, two secretaries, I want to say. I don't remember. Anyway, you had four staff positions. In 93, you had three. And then in 04, you increased it by uh, half a percent which would be a part-time person. So you were at 3.5%. And then in 2010, you went down to three. <clears throat> Going moving forward to 2023, 2027 projections. You wanna walk through this one? 
So in this chart, we show that our 23 and 24 budgets are balanced. Our 24 budget is balanced with a current millage rate of 4.715. Um, we went ahead and did the state's calculation of our maximum millage rate, which is 4.3497. Any millage rate above that requires a supermajority vote. And if we went to the 4.3497, that equates to about a $105 million cut to our expenses. Um, for our out years, we went ahead and looked at maybe a 5% increase in property values. I know we've had two really good years, but I think that it might level off at some point, and 5% was our long time average. So as we get closer to next year, 2025 budget this time, uh, it'll be a completely different number, but we wanted to be a little conservative in that regards. And so we went ahead and looked at what our potential budgets could be in the out year, what the shortfalls could be there. This next chart just simply reflects the history of changes in property values and millage rates. And so the blue line reflects the property values, increases and decreases. The green line uh, reflects our millage rate. So as we started in 92, you see the uh, actual property values start to increase. Our various boards over the years decrease our millage rate and then they increased and then they decreased. As you can see, we started to decrease our millage rate as values started to escalate uh, back in 06 and 07. And then we had the sharp decline of values um, over 8 and 9 and into 10. Uh, and the board started to make adjustments to our millage rate. So we were going down because the values were higher. And then once it crashed, we had to increase uh, over and above our millage rate um, to get back to providing the appropriate uh, levels of service to our residents. And Lisa would be smiling if she was here. Uh, so we're going to try to smile together here uh, to bring this through fruition. When this morning we had the pleasure of Ms. Jacks to talk to us on property values. And so she talked about her just value, uh, which is slightly less, like 15% less than the market rate. And so we, when we go to total adjusted value, we show that as 100% as we start to do our calculations. Um, and then we have to look at the homestead cap that she talked about, 3%. So we then deduct what was not um, assessed based on that 3% cap, which was 100 and Eight billion, and then our non-homesteaded cap is at 10%. That was another 26 billion we deducted, and then other um, deductions we took uh, was at 15.8 billion, and that includes like ag lands and other type of areas in which we reduce uh, the amount of value. Then we came up with our total assessed value of 330 billion. That was 68.61 percent. Then we go on to back out our exemptions: 25,000 for homestead, which was 9 billion, an additional 25,000 homestead, which is 8.2 billion. And then we look at other exemptions of 24 billion, which includes governments, institutional uses, uh, disability, people with disabilities, blind, et cetera. So their, their rates are lowered. Uh, so then we come up with our total taxable value. And that taxable value is then $228 billion, And we, that is roughly about 60% of the just value, which is below the market value. We look at our millage rate impact on homesteaded property. We went in to look at the median assessed value. And in Palm Beach County, the median assessed value uh, in 23 was 188,000. And in 24, it's 193,640. Then you less the homestead exemption. So the median taxable value for 23 was 138,000. For 24, it's 143. So that's a 4.1% increase for the median taxable value.
then you take that time our operating uh, millage rates plus our voted debt millage rate, uh, which slightly went down. And then you look at your property operating taxes. So the difference between 23 for this home uh, in taxes um, and then the between 23 and 24 is a $26.59 increase. Our voted debt decreased by 126. So you're really looking at a total of about $25, 3.9% for the median home price. And we all know reading the newspaper you can't find a median home price unless you've been there forever in Palm Beach County, uh, which we've got 96% of them for the most part have been somewhat capped. But if we looked at property value, let's say 370,000 uh, for property, that's before the 50,000 homestead exemption. Our millage rate for 2023 was 4.715. They paid uh, $1,500 uh, $1, for their tax. And 24 at that same millage rate, they would increase by $52, a 3.5% increase. When we look at a half a million dollar home, um, they paid $2,100 in 23. We anticipate them paying 20, almost $2,200, a $70 uh, increase. And then we look at a million, uh, it's roughly, they paid $4,400 and in 24, they'd be paying $4,600, $141 more in their property tax. You want to do leases? Okay, so I'll take Lisa's other favorite one too. So we wanted to we talk about the cap with the homesteaded property. So we just wanted to kind of show an example of what it looks like over the years. So in 2014, this particular home had a just value of 171000 but the assessed value was 150 less the homestead exemption of 50, bringing a taxable value to 100,000. And as this home stayed homesteaded with the same owner, it could only increase CPI or 3%. So in 2015, CPI was only 0.8%, so it only increased a slight amount. And then 2016, 0.7%, so just a very slight increase. And you can kind of see the history through um, 2020, 2020 that it stayed under that 3% cap. So I think this is one of the things Dorothy was talking about, that this home now had a just value of about 284,000, but after the homestead exemption, it's paying taxes on about 115,000. So then the house sells in 2021, it comes on at the just value of the sales price, and now the taxable value kind of matches that just value less the homestead but now that house is capped so you see it increasing three percent in 2022 but you see the just value increasing 31 percent and it just kind of gives you an example of what that means to the difference between the just value and um, the taxable value and how when we say it's 180,000 median this is kind of a good example of how that happens And then this is our slide on the maximum millage rate. It's a state calculation. It gets a little confusing. It looks at last year's rollback rate, this year rates, but it comes and uses a per capita Florida income. But what's important for 2024 is that our maximum millage rate is 4.3497. Anything higher than that requires a supermajority vote. We've been doing a supermajority vote for the last few years, so this is pretty normal for us. Um, anything above that would cause, um, would need a unanimous vote. So as we uh, continue with our budget issues for 2024, we are preparing for a leveling off of future property values. Um, one side of your administrator hopes the values continue to go up. The other side knows that we need values to be where people can afford to live, work, and play here in Palm Beach County. And so we're preparing for that, and part of that preparing is also building our reserves for whenever the market starts to cool or start to level off and, and slow down. Our July 1st property values, we typically receive three to four million dollars between June 1 and July 1st. Last year was an anomaly. Uh, we ended up with roughly about 17 million. 
don't know if we're going to end up with that uh, this time. So we'll 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 see when Dorothy comes in, uh, when Ms. Jax comes in with her July one values. The other thing that we are looking at, and we're we're hoping to continue to build on our CPI, to continue to build on our reserves, and then to also continue to tackle our affordable workforce housing here in Palm Beach County, because that is going to be critical if we're gonna remain a viable and sustainable community. Because if people can't afford to live here, they're gonna move. And one of the moves have been to our neighbors to the north, uh, but their prices are also going up. And so they're now moving outside of the driving range. And so we do look forward to your input. We're looking to answer any questions that you may have um, regarding this proposed budget. Thank you very much. Uh, before we uh, turn this back to the board, just want to remind anybody, if you're planning on speaking uh, this afternoon or this evening, please get your cards in um, as quickly as possible so we can uh, stop taking cards. Okay, appreciate that. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Commissioner Marino, you are recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. I already said I wanted a military rate reduction, so that's not going to be a surprise. And I'm going to tell you what I'm asking for. I'm going to tell you why I think we can get there. Um, I'm actually looking to go to 4.5. I've reviewed the entire budget identified some areas that I think we can do some cost savings without sacrificing the level of service. Um, if we can explore opportunities for increased efficiency and optimizing our processes, we can definitely better allocate our resources and achieve a tax reduction. So I've identified six different ways. So one is um, vacancies. And uh, for the last 26 pay periods, We've averaged 541 vacancies. And if you just throw a number at there of about 50K for each one of those, that comes out to roughly $27 million that didn't get spent, which goes, I know, goes down into the general fund, and, and that's what we work with in the, in the, pre, uh, the following years. Uh, so that would be one place we could find some cash. Joe Abruzzo, Claire Abruzzo, thank you very much. Uh, interesting conversation uh, with Claire Abruzzo uh, and his. Um, projection of maybe $160 million that we didn't know of, of which 15% of that would be the general fund. That would come out to roughly $24 million. Uh, Ann Gannon. Ann Gannon uh, returned $44 million to the county in the 2020, 2020, 2021 year, and she's projecting to return $50 million in the 21, 22 year. Um, grant programs. And this is something that is not really significant, but it's an important item in our budget. Um, many times when we're signing off on an item, it says when the grant funding for this program goes away, so does the job. And oftentimes, we find a way to absorb that job. I want to make sure that we know where that job actually is. I want to know if we are, in fact, keeping that job or if that job has sunsetted. We, don't, you know, we really don't get that figure. So I want, just want to make sure when a grant goes away, if the grant said, when the grant goes away, the position goes away, we need to pay more attention to that. And our reserves. Um, I, <laughs> I appreciate how much money we have in reserves. Um, 10 years ago, we only had 8% of our budget in reserves and we were still AAA rated. So I think that maybe we can not put as much money into reserves as we're projecting this year, the 150 million-ish that you were putting in, I believe. Um, so obviously this is a lot to throw at you. Uh, and balancing the reduction is, you know, something we need to do. Uh, and if we can lighten our tax burden, we're in a position right now where everything is, everything is going up. Everything that, every, you know, HOAs, insurance, gas, food. And if we keep the millage rate the same, yes, we're not, in effect, we're not raising the millage rate, but we're actually raising the dollars that people pay. And I know Dorothy and I have had this conversation before. Um, if we 
stay the same at 4.71, taxes are going. The amount of taxes goes up. The amount paid that people have to write goes up. That's why I'm looking for something where we don't do that, where when someone gets their tax bill this year, it did not go up. You know, to Administrator Baker, I have full confidence in you that you can do this, even though you're shaking your head. You knew, you knew from the day I sat over there where, where Sarah's sitting two and a half years ago that this was it, you know, something that I was looking for. But your staff, they are so skilled. Expertise is, we come to you because it is your expertise. You're dedicated. Uh, you have fiscal responsibility is forefront in your minds. Um, so that's why I'm confident that you can tweak what we're doing here. Um, and why a millage rate reduction? Financial relief for our residents. We know we need that. And there's a lot of people on fixed incomes, yet their insurance is going up and their taxes are gonna go up. So that's, that's tough for us. Stimulating economic growth. So if we can lower our millage rate, we can actually put more money back into what makes our economy grow instead of spending it on big government. So if we can do that, we'll get more people out there. Enhancing affordability and attractiveness. So again, if the taxes are a little lower, we can answer a little bit of that affordable housing issue. Not a lot. This is a tiny, tiny thing, but I know we can do it. And it shows that we're accountable to our taxpayers, that we're really paying attention to what we're doing. And I, I could go on and on, but I also, I'm going to close with this. I did a, um, I did a survey. I did a survey of, of folks, and interestingly enough, 35% of the people that answered the survey came back with reduced taxes. The second one was address growth and development issues. So our job as a Board of County Commissioners, this is the biggest job we have. And we don't take this job lightly, by the way, everybody in the audience, we don't take this job lightly. I mean, I can tell you, there have been countless hours from every single one of us up here trying to figure out how we can return some dollars to you. And that's what we're doing today. And so hopefully, I could continue, but I'm not going to, uh, because this was more of a, what I'd like to see as opposed to questions. Um, but again, I would like to see us get to the 4.5. Um, if we can do that, that would be fabulous. And I'm sure I've got more, I'm sure there's other questions or comments, um, and we do have comment cards, so thank you, Mayor. You're very welcome. Thank you. Um, do you mind just giving me a count on the comment cards? We see how many we have. Um, Commissioner Bernard, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Commissioner Marie, you know, uh, you mentioned to at a 4.5 uh, millage. Uh, Ms. Baker, just to make sure, um, in regards to when we're setting uh, the millage, do we have to ma make that decision today? Or is it when we're setting the millage, I believe, which date is that? July. July 11th. So on July 11th is when we would set the millage. Set the millage. Uh, but do we need to make that decision today to? No, you don't. Okay. But would we have another workshop? We could definitely have another workshop. Uh, we can or actually, can we when we bring, when we come in July 11th, we can bring the bu proposed budget based on directions uh, and then tell you what, and you know, sitting here, we know 4.5 million, I need to cut $62 million out of the budget. Um, that's based on what we've got today. Okay. If we wait until July 1, I will have other values and then we'll know, I'll be in a better position to be able to put together that packet for you on July 11. But if the board wants another workshop, we can definitely set up another Commissioner workshop. Commissioner Marino, I know I, if we can, I, I'm not saying to do another workshop, but I, what I would love to be able to do is before we vote on it on July 11th, if there's a, if we can have a discussion just to make sure uh, we'll send them back to see what they can do. And then if we need to do a workshop before we take that vote, it could be on that same day. Yes, sir. And that's normally what we do. We bring uh, the budget package back, you go through it, and then you set the millage. Okay. So I, I Commissioner Marino mentioned these six items, and uh, I would love to, you know, work with 
staff and to see what can we cut and to see if it's possible to get to this 4.5. Uh, and if it, you know, especially I know that when uh, Ms. Uh, Dorothy Jax was here earlier, she said that the numbers are gonna increase a little bit. So we'll get that opportunity to see what else we can save. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, I don't see any, any other lights at this time. Oh, Commissioner Baxter. <coughs> so I do support, uh, you're saying that if we reduce our millage rate to 4.5, it would cost or save our tax dollars, um, our residents, 62 million? No, I have to cut 62 million. million from the budget. Overall, that, that'll save taxpayers, but on an individual basis, because the Board of County Commissioners, when people get their tax bill, it is every taxing entity on that tax bill. And so we make up probably 20% of that tax bill. And so we can cut 62 million. Every dollar counts, because I'm a taxpayer, <laughs> and every dollar counts but you're not gonna see an overwhelming amount being, being reduced on the overall tax bill unless everybody, all of the taxing entities, then that's when people will see and feel a really big difference in it. But that's not to say we can't do our part if that's what this board wants to do. How much more revenues versus costs have we brought in to summarizing the what we've gone over already versus last year. Would this really, this 62 million cutting from the budget, haven't we already gone above and beyond bringing that in um, based on the numbers that Commissioner Marino has already pointed out, like the extra 160 million that Senator Abruzzo has saved us, the, um, I mean, there was a list. I don't think I need to say that again. <laughs> well, um, speaking with staff, and um, I want to say Senator Abruzzo, Clerk Abruzzo. Excuse me, yes, Clerk Abruzzo. <laughs> um, actually, yes, that $160 million sounds good by being interest collected by the end of the fiscal year. But a significant portion of that goes to other funds, funds that we cannot sweep that money out of. Of that 160 million, we believe and we, we think that it'll be in the 20 plus million that we'll be able to account for. But the other dollars are, the other interest earned primarily are in uh, our enterprise funds. It is in other funds that we can't just sweep that interest out of. We have to leave that interest in there. And there are a few dollars that we may be able to sweep out of capital, but not a whole lot. And can I just add also, we've accounted for it in our 24 budget. So part of building our 24 budget is we look at our current 23 revenues and expenses and we estimate what we're gonna collect and what we're gonna spend. And that difference is our carry forward, our fund balance. So that's part of our budget. So for interest earnings in the general fund, we've already estimated that we would collect $20 million in the current year, and we've budgeted $18 million for next year. So we've already included it. So it's not found money for me. We've already included it as part of our 24 budget. And the same thing with like Ann Gannon, we know that we're gonna get money back. <coughs> so we've already included that we're gonna get excess fees back from the other constitutional officers. So it's part of our budget now. Do we know, if you don't mind, Mayor, oh, cool. do, do we know how much we would save each household by reducing it to a 4.5 millage? Yeah, I tried to just do, because I wanted to keep it average, even dollars right? and mm -hmm. stuff. So if you had a 150,000 taxable home with a $50,000 homestead exemption, I took it to $100,000 in taxable value because that's easier math sitting at the table. So if we went from 4.715 to 4.5, it saves every $100,000 of taxable value, $21.50 a year. I would. Dollars a month. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, that's I, for, yeah, you pay it once a year, so yeah. And the average taxable value was a little higher. It was like 188,000. It's just easier for 100,000 sitting here at the table than I don't have to do too complicated of math. I would say, and this actually, um, I think would, a lot of people don't realize that businesses don't qual, they do not qualify for a homestead exemption. So if you own a building, that's huge. It's capped at 10%, yeah. Which is huge for our small business community and um, people who own you know, a business every year um, coming out of their pockets to pay for that because if it's not your home, I, I mean, so I think this would actually be even a bigger savings to the business community, especially the small businesses as well. Uh, being able to reduce this millage is, I mean, I feel it every single year. Um, and it, it, it hurts a lot every single year. So I, again, I, I support that. And I'm going to say something a little contradictory here. Uh, we have a couple priorities, I feel, in the county, um, even before sitting here. And one of them was services, and one is infrastructure that I feel are very important to our community. So where I do support the, the 4.5, um, but I, I wouldn't want to eliminate positions. I would like to try to find prioritizing within our budget, so not increasing it, but prioritize within there somewhere we can incentivize more people because we are losing people all the time, daily. And it's in our building departments, it's in multiple departments, and we get the emails and the phone calls and um, all the complaints that we are not able to service our residents. And I um, have a very large unincorporated area of my district, and so that means that I, they can't just call their city or municipality, they have to come directly to me. And, <laughs> And so it's a big deal to be able to give them those services um, from our county. That's what we're here for. So I just want to keep that in mind um, with moving forward. I would like to see some place where we can help incentivize, get more employees here, more people in the door to help serve our residents. Um, it's just, it's a big problem. And then the other thing is roads. I would just like to get a priority on these roads are getting a little out of control, especially in our unincorporated areas. And that's all I really want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Com uh, Commissioner Woodward, you're recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I've gone over the budget a couple times and each time a new question comes. So another new question. On slide six, with the fund balance history where we talk about um, bonded, uh, how we keep our AAA bond, and we're comparing ourselves to other counties by percentage. Uh, how important is the percentage versus the actual dollar amount in our fund to keep the AAA bond rating? So the, um, so the percentage is pretty important. It's what the rating agencies typically look at. Um, they don't like to tell you you have to have this percentage because they try to look at everything as a whole but they do look at what everybody else around you. So that's why we picked the other AAA rated counties here in Florida and tried to look at their averages. Okay, so for the other counties that we're comparing ourselves to, I know we have percentages for them. Do we know um, how equivalent their budgets are to ours? I would have to go back and look it up. I have some of that information, mm -hmm. but um, that's why the percentage kind of equalizes us. Yeah. in that regards because it's the fund balance to their revenues so this kind of equalizes it by looking at the percentages and not just a dollar amount yeah we're not dreaming of proposing a 56.85 percent uh indian river county is a smaller county than ours uh, but that's not what we dream of not at all we're looking if we can get uh to the average uh for florida counties and that's 36 35 36 percent i think we will be in good condition okay and the bond agencies do they tell us to, about that number too around Thank the 30 pardon? the bond agencies do they recommend around 30 35 percent they don't like to say they ask me why i pick a you know a percentage a lot of time or they have in the past they used to say it was 25 but they didn't really but now they've kind of gone away and said we think you should be close to everybody else's and stuff so they don't like to say a number but 30 to 35% would be where I think is more comfortable and realistic. 
Okay, I just I don't want us to get the number skewed too high with the Indian River County having not at all. 57 percent. I mean no, that no, kind of is an lot. outlier. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or Broward, which is right next yeah. door to us. Right. We're and Broward has actually that. very little unincorporated, so that their is. budget doesn't necessarily compare to ours, even right. though the the size of the yeah. county would. Right. That's correct. Thank you, Vice Mayor. You're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I think today what we're doing is we're really just looking at the mile high view of the budget and our costs. I think it's important to recognize that we will soon get into the weeds. But like any family, we balance our budget. We have to balance the budget. And in a family, when there are issues where um, costs are too high, the money you're bringing in is not enough, uh, what families usually do is they find other ways to raise revenue. And we can do that in the county. I'd like to look at that in the county without raising taxes. We can, we can uh, be able to pull in additional revenue. Um, and, and I think this is something that we need to look at, just like in a family. Um, somebody needs to get a second job, pull the money in, you do it. Uh, but you don't let the kids go hungry. And the second part is not even, is first to try to find other streams of revenue. And the second, of course, is ways to cut the cost of doing government business. Uh, and we saw that today in the presentation by Ms. Jacks, uh, our property appraiser, on ways through technology that we can cut the cost of doing government business. We can cut a lot of the fat I think we're pretty slim right now, but, uh, but there are ways to do it and ways to develop housing uh, so that we don't have a lot of the transportation problems that we have, where people w can live, work, and play within a five mile radius so that we don't have to build more roads, more cats expensive, more county roads. So this is sort of the mile high view and I'm um, getting a good, good look at it and everybody else is too, but I'm, Anxious at some point in July, when we get into the weeds, we start looking at how we can cut and how we can raise streams of revenue without raising taxes. So I'm very pleased with, uh, with the outlook that we have so far. Thank you. Thank you very much, staff. <coughs> Thank you, Vice Mayor. All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and, and start our public comment. We have 16 cards in, so we'll no longer be taking any additional cards. And... Get started. All right, we have two podiums, and I believe we have a handheld mic in case someone isn't able to make it to the podium. Uh, Carmen Sita Mitchell, <coughs> followed by Julie Patel. Good afternoon, Mayor Weiss, Vice Mayor Sachs, Commissioners, Madam Administrator. It is always an honor to come before you. For the public record, my name is Carmen Sita Mitchell. I'm the chair of the Palm Trans Service Board. Uh, I know that you all received my letter on Friday, so I'm going to try not to be redundant. Um, but for those who didn't, weren't privy to the letter, um, I'm going to be blunt. I know that this is a preliminary budget hearing and we're looking to reduce uh, the expenditure to taxpayers. But you have to spend money to save money. And so what I'm asking for, humbly, is a dedicated funding source for transportation. You have all spoken so eloquently on many occasions about workforce housing, workforce education, um, the fact that the Palm Beach County is growing, um, all these issues. And as Vice Mayor Sachs just eloquently said, this is a mile high view. But with the cost of living being what it is, people are going to have to join the Mile High Club to pay their bills. So I just think, yes, I'm sorry. Um, I just think that we need to consider that sustainable transportation is going to work in conjunction with workforce housing, with workforce education. Um, our so-called choice riders are going to be running out of choices soon with the cost of gasoline, food, rent, mortgages, et cetera. I represent, as you know, the fixed route riders with seat number nine, but I also support those of which are my students at Palm Beach State College, part of your constituency, right? Most of them are coming of age to vote. I still represent the senior community and those who take part in the DSS meal programs, as well as those of us who are with disabilities, right? Um, we have the good fortune in this county to have servant leaders. 
Under Mr. Forbes' direction, Palm Tran has become a service in the last 20 years that I can utilize with confidence. And without embarrassing you, there are at least two people on the dais who I know personally to be servant leaders, who helped me, a person with disabilities, with my food, and helped me make tea at the State of the County luncheon and breakfast. Um, so I'm asking you if you could allow the voters to decide what will work for them, allow them to decide yay or nay to a dedicated funding source, and you will see that if we can raise the sustainability of our transportation, it will actually enable us to grow the community at the same rate that we're growing the people and that we're trying to grow the housing and the education. Without sustainable transportation, those of us with disabilities are in fact handicapped, right? Which we don't like to use those terms anymore to be inclusive, right? But everyone else who financially is strapped because of the economy right now is also in a place of handicap when they have to decide whether to pay for food, transportation, or their utilities. So again, I thank you. Um, I'm honored to be here. I'm honored by your service. And I implore you, please provide us with a dedicated funding source. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Patel. Thank you. Good afternoon. Mayor Weiss and Commissioners, I stand before you today not as a representative of the City of Revere Beach, nor as the President of Palm Beach County League of Cities, but as a concerned citizen. Uh, I had, it has come to my attention, and the same topic, slightly narrower focus for me. Uh, it's come to my attention that there may be a possibility that some of the bus routes in Revere Beach may be curtailed or cut back, and in particular, Route 21. Route 21 goes from Mangonia Park through Stony Brook, now known as Azure Estates, uh, through Lake Park and up to the Palm Beach Gardens Mall. I happened to ride it yesterday just so that I could have a sense of what people are saying about it, what the riders are saying, you know, what is it like to ride that bus. I encourage you to do the same thing in your own communities and particularly uh, communities where there are people who, for whom that transportation is the only way they can get to places. Um, in, in my conversation with the property manager at Stony Brook now, Azure Estates, she said to me, and I quote, I have a number of elderly, disabled, and families who use that bus service for doctor appointments, such as dialysis, chemo, children and parent appointments, et cetera. I also have residents who use the bus daily to and from work. Our community is depending on that transportation for their day-to-day -day living needs, as many in our community alone do not have their own transportation. Public transportation is not merely a convenience. It's a lifeline for many individuals and families in our community. The residents of Azure Estates in particular heavily rely on Route 21 to access employment opportunities, educational institutions, healthcare facilities, and other vital services. By reducing or eliminating this route, we risk cutting off the link that connects them to the essential resources they need to thrive. Transportation inequality is a grave issue that affects our, community, our community's most vulnerable members. Many of the Azure Estates residents may not have access to private vehicles or alternative modes of transportation. They depend on the reliability and affordability of public buses to fulfill their basic needs and improve their quality of life. By taking away these routes, we are effecti effectively limiting their opportunities, putting them further into isolation, and perpetuating a cycle of poverty. I understand, maybe more than many, the challenges you face in making difficult decisions regarding budgetary constraints. Uh, but I urge you to prioritize the needs of the most vulnerable members of our community. In closing, I ask you to reflect on the profound impact this decision will have on the lives of the Azure Estates residents and our entire community. Let us not turn our backs on those who need our support the most. Please, I urge you, let us work together to find alternative solutions that protect the integrity of our public transportation system, ensuring that it continues to serve as a lifeline for our community. Thank you for your time and for considering the voices of those who rely on this service. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Heather Smith, followed by Michael Chimes, followed by Patricia Moore, followed by Eileen Jasper. You could take. Oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Bernard, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Botel, what I'd love to be able to do is to, if we can ride Route 21 together, uh, since I represent Asia, Asia Estates, and I'd love for us to do that. I've just asked my staff to schedule it, and so we'll coordinate with your office so in that way. And Mr. Forbes, if we can do that so we can take a look at that. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners, and County Administrators. My name is Heather Smith, and I'm a business owner and resident of Palm Beach County. 
I have been volunteering at Palm Beach County Animal Care and Control for the last seven years, and I am the lead volunteer for the dog side of the shelter. On average, I spend between 15 to 20 hours a week volunteering on top of my full-time job. Because of my lead volunteer position, I work closely with management and most departments, to, and I get to see what happens behind the scenes. I am here today because I have serious concerns about the overcrowding in our shelter and the fact that dogs and cats are going to die if we do not figure out how to get them out of the shelter and into good homes. My understanding is that there are two critical positions of adoption coordinator and foster coordinator being considered for the budget and I'm here to support that decision. Here are some stats for you. May of this year, intake of our dogs was up 22%. Adoptions were down and rescue pulls were down 22% and only three dogs went into foster. With two new positions that I mentioned, foster and adoption numbers could and should increase with, some solely, with someone solely focusing on getting the animals out. As long as I have been at the shelter, I have noticed that there's far more focus on the dogs at the shelter than there is getting them out of the shelter. The county is charged with taking care of them because their owner could not or would not care for them. But it is an old mindset to think that, there's a lot, there, that there is not a lot of options for them. And these positions of adoption coordinator and foster coordinator are exactly what our shelter needs to help the dogs be fostered and adopted. The exciting thing about both of these positions is that their power is exponential. By harnessing the power of existing volunteers and the public will be using many hands to make lighter work. It's a winning combination, saving more dogs and cats by utilizing volunteers and creating new relationships with the community. Here's one last stat. Approximately four million dogs and cats are adopted each year. Please give our dogs and cats the same opportunity to be among that number by approving these desperately needed positions. Thank you. Vice Mayor, you're recognized. Thank you so much for your concern and for your volunteer. I'm working on that issue with Ms. Steele. So if you could contact my office this week, I'd like to work with you on that. And yes, we need to do, and we are working towards that, but I could use your expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Marino. Heather, before you walk away, thank you so much. I know, our, I know you've been talking with my staff uh, quite a lot, and um, I think the rest of us on the board here um, have no, I don't see any doubt that we would be funding those two positions. Uh, and we also did just recently um, work towards purchasing the property right next door to the animal uh, care and control building uh, in an effort to get us growing in and hoping that we can as you said, get more animals adopted. So thank you very much for all you're doing because it's a lot of time that you put in, so thank you. Thank you for all of your help. Commissioner Baxter, you're recognized. I was also just gonna say thank you, Heather. Volunteers have been so essential at animal care and control. And um, again, to the point of being able to help with the service, I again would support those positions. I mean, animals are, you know, a lot of people's family, but sometimes they just can't make it work. I would also like some, just based on what she had said, just some information, and we don't need a workshop on it, uh, but just, just some information on um, when the overcrowding started and how it's increased over the years and a potential cause. Are we gonna say this is all COVID? Is this a change in how we're handling the animals we currently have? Um, but just some more detailed information on that. Thank you. Uh, just to share with you all, I have nine kittens in my house from ACC. <laughs> you take ten. <laughs> Vice Mayor, you're recognized. Thank you. uh, that's very good, Commissioner Baxter. And I'm, um, since we can't talk about these issues amongst ourselves, but I've got a good group, uh, thanks to Ms. Baker, uh, that, um, that were in the uh, animal care and control facility. And what we're working on, and I'll say it now, what we're working on is our veterans groups to uh, look at some of the animals there, and they've already chosen seven of them, uh, to work with them to train them to be service animals for our veterans. And then we're also looking at some of the private facilities that have money and that they bring in dogs from other states. Uh, they can start taking some of our dogs in the county 
uh, and these private facilities, and, uh, and they have much more access to the public so that the dogs find their forever homes. So yes, we are working on this, and I think that uh, thanks to Jan Steele at the facility, but you, everybody's welcome to go see it. It is really, and I have a letter here from Semperi Fi, the marine organization that works with animals for, for our, our veterans, that it is the best facility he's ever seen. So we're working on it, we're gonna take care of it, and uh, we're gonna get another cat for, uh, for the mayor, so it comes up to 10, <laughs> and, and everything will be fine. Thank you, though, for your concern. Thank you. Uh, Michael Chimes. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to express my concerns regarding the services rendered by uh, Palm Tran Connection. I moved down here over 19 years ago, primarily because of the services that were available since I could no longer drive because of my visual impairment. And uh, the opportunities uh, that were made available to go to various uh, locations, uh, the Lighthouse for the Blind, the Braille Club, uh, Florida, Florida Outreach Center for the Blind, where I've studied computer technology, uh, cell phone or iPhone uh, technology, as well as Braille. And these services are available to probably over a thousand, if not more, constituents in Palm Beach County. So uh, my concern is that the county would continue to provide these services that are so much in need for so many. And uh, I, like I said, I moved here because of the fact that these services are available. So I hope and pray that uh, you as constituents, if you were in our position, to see if you would like to have these same services available should you have visual impairment uh, as we have. So again, I thank you for the opportunity to express my concerns and I hope that our budgetary uh, uh, influence will continue and provide these services that are so integral and so vitally important to thousands in Palm Beach County. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Patricia Moore followed by Eileen Jasper and Ann Schmidt. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you very much for the opportunity for our community to speak regarding transportation. I came here from a county that did not have any source. And when I learned of Palm Tran Connection, it opened doors for me to be able to live my life and do the things that I needed to do. And so I would like to please have you consider that we have a dedicated transportation funding source so that we can continue to live our lives in dignity. Sunset the infrastructure tax and substitute it for anything. Thank you. Eileen? Good evening. My name is Eileen Jasper and I ride Palm Tran Connection. I use it quite often to go to uh, the grocery store and uh, doctor appointments. And recently I had a procedure done at the hospital, so I used it to go there also. And uh, please, I ask you to keep the funding in place. It's vitally important. Uh, I was born uh, with a vision impairment, so I do not drive, I've never driven. And um, I'm quite appreciative of the uh, service that we have here. Thank you so much. And keep the funding in place. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Schmidt. Hello, good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Administrators, Commissioners. Nice to be here. My name is Ann Schmidt. As a volunteer at Animal Care and Control, I regularly, regularly counsel and comfort members of the public who are brought to tears very, viewing the conditions of our county shelter. Children sometimes run out because they can't handle the stress created by viewing and hearing the suffering caused by the living conditions of our animals. Dogs on top of each other in small kennels are just a start. I always try to express to them that the dogs are loved by staff and volunteers. However, anything I say can't outweigh the visual of what's happening. Potential adoptive families simply walk out because they are so disgusted by the conditions at ACC. 
local population increases, lack of education concerning, cost of animal ownership, spaying and neutering all contribute to overcrowding at the shelter. I do feel if we work together, we can make a lot of positive changes so our shelter doesn't have to feel like a prison. So to start, I am here today to support the county administrator's budget for what is needed at ACC. The impact of this budget is so important. The budget is key not only for the welfare of our animals, but for improving safety for the public who visit our facility daily. By adding these key positions proposed, safety will vastly be improved for the county staff and volunteers who are at increased risk when staffing is low and overcrowding is high. These positions will provide safety, support, and education for all. An increase in staff will also help in preparing ACC for its expansion. The FY 2025 capital project at Animal Care and Control is scheduled for funding from Surtax, and I ask you, please, please maintain that schedule. We have 1.5 million people living in Palm Beach County. We have 144 dog kennels. In May alone, our intake was 408, and the outcome of that was only 214 in rescues and adoptive homes. The numbers don't lie on how critical this expansion is, so please, approve the budget and let's move forward with plans to break ground so we can have a safer, ha healthier, happier environment for our public, staff, volunteers, and most importantly, our fur friends. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, Janet Algeciras, Nikki Brown, Jeff Mara, Shanna Ostrovitz. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Janet Algeciras. I'm a Palm Beach County small business owner and I'm also a Palm Beach County resident. And I also volunteer for the Animal Care Control in Palm Beach County. I wanna thank you everyone for your time for, and for letting me speak. As we all know, more people have been moving into Palm Beach County recently. This has also brought more animals being surrendered by Palm Beach County Care Control Shelter. Many of these animals, dogs, cats, have been abandoned or surrendered with no fault of their own. We are over capacity at our local shelter. Palm Beach Animal Care Control team and volunteers are working overtime to ensure the best quality and care, but they do not have enough space. With only 144 kennels, 200 dogs, two dogs are being placed in a single kennel. The number of pets in its care has risen over 300. I'm here to ask to please pass a proposed budget for Palm Beach Animal Care Control. We need those positions. I think it's gonna alleviate a lot of the stress in employees and volunteers, and we're all working hard to keep this unforeseen, to unforeseen situations that we're all facing. The budget is key, not only for the welfare of the animals, but also in improving the safety for the public who visit the facility daily. It's also greatly improved safety for the county staff volunteers from our community who are at increased risk when staffing is low and overcrowding is high. An increase in staff would also help to prepare animal care control in their future expansion, as we, all, as we all hope they're still on track to break ground on 2025. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Sir, how are you today? How are you doing? Thank you very much. I'm Nikki Brown, I represent Palm Tran, and I'm also advocating for all the citizens of Palm Beach County who do use public transportation. Um, I have a lot to say about Palm Tran. Uh, ridership has picked up, and I have to say that this is, uh, this is something you guys wanna, wanna improve on. You need to put the budget up there. Don't, do not cut any budget when it comes to transportation, because these are the people that put you in office. And these are the people that put you guys and give you guys what you need. Now don't cut that budget because these people need the transportation to go, go to work. Um, the holiday hours have really picked up. The, the, I mean, the amount of people riding Palm Train on holidays is, is skyrocket. I, I've, seen, I've seen buses that are so overloaded that they have to get other buses. And this is, a, this is, this is something. And the service that Palm Train has offered out there is just amazing, amazing. The ridership has picked up so much. After the pandemic, I mean, it's been, it's been like over, I'd say over 20 to 30 people per bus. 
Um, and this this is something you guys want to keep. And I'm not just saying that for one route. I'm talking about all routes. I read the 43, the number three, the two, the 30, the four. I mean, all the buses in Palm Beach County have picked up on the ridership. And it's, this is amazing. So this is something you guys want to keep up there. And another thing also, I'd like to thank Ms. Baker for riding with me on Palm Trans, seeing the right one. And also uh, to the commissioners up here, I like you guys. To, I'd love for you guys to ride with me. I'd like for all you guys to take a ride on Palm Train and see if we sell. So, Commissioner Sachs and Mayor, please um, come on right, right Palm Train. I won't forget uh, Mark Bernard up there. Please come right Palm Train. <laughs> and thank you for all the wonderful job you guys are doing. And also, big thanks to Mr. Forbes for excellent <clears throat> director. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hamara. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, commissioners, mayor. Um, my name is Jeff Hamara. I'm a councilman in Royal Palm Beach. I'm also a proud member of the Transportation Planning Agency, and, um, but I'm not speaking formally in those roles. I'm speaking from insight and knowledge from those roles. So um, I'm here to talk about mass transit, as others have just recently, and, and I, I, I'm pleased to hear that much conversation because I know that helps with priority decisions, and ultimately that's what drives budgets. So one of the things I wanted to point out was um, something that you all know very well, and that is we have a couple of significant problems, challenges here in Royal Palm Beach, in Royal Palm Beach, and I just said I wasn't speaking from Royal Palm Beach, in, in the Palm Beach County, and, and the, the two of them are kind of related, and very much related, actually. One is housing, affordable workforce housing. The other is transportation. The two of them come together nicely in solution format if you have good plans. The really good news is we do have some really excellent plans. Uh, the housing for all, Palm Beach County, the initiative that's been taken with the $200 million bond. All of that is moving in the right direction, and I applaud you all for doing that. But it needs to be coupled with a good transportation plan, one that really has mass transit at its heart. Mass transit is essential to dealing with not only those two issues, uh, but, but of course the economy itself. Uh, therefore, I would strongly advise, strongly suggest, Increased investments in mass transit, they are certainly critical. This will allow improvements in many different ways. Palm Transit is, of course, at, at the core. And Palm Transit efficiency, reliability, and attractiveness. I know Mr. Forbes has many, many plans to move in the direction of improvement. And at the same time, um, ultimately, at the end of the day, cost effectiveness is critical. So the allocation of budget funding needs to consider those things on a large scale, but also on small scales. Pilot projects are extremely critical. They are a way of understanding the benefit, the true benefit, of some of these significant improvements that might otherwise escape support. For example, there's a pilot project that's being considered for an express commuter bus between downtown West Palm Beach to the uh, mall at Wellington Green by using Okeechobee Boulevard to State Road 7. A small project like that can give us important information about how we can incrementally improve the overall performance, not only of Palm Tran, but also of mass transit in a longer run in a bigger picture. As you know, the TPA has offered a fully integrated land use and mobility plan known as the 561 Enhanced Mass, mass Transit Plan. This plan identifies a optimum mix of land use Transit-oriented development. Councilman, uh, your three minutes have expired. Oh, oh thank you. you wanna, can you just wrap I'm, up? I'm sorry. So uh, if I could just wrap up simply by saying, I would ask for your consideration as you prepare the budget uh, to uh, increase investment in mass transit at this point in time and also fully embrace the 561 uh, enhanced mass transit plan. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Commissioner Baxter, you're recognized. I actually wanted to ask the councilman a question. Yes, so thank you for coming out. Uh, it's very important that we get some insight. And I guess we've heard 
different things. Um, and we had already spoken previously at a commission meeting about a dedicated funding source and waiting until we thought those funds were better handled as such. But something else was brought up, and I wanted to ask you, maybe not in your official capacity, but in your experience, do you think that the municipalities would be able to contribute large amounts towards this transit program that we're discussing? So this transit program involves all of us. In fact, <clears throat> if it doesn't, it won't be successful. Uh, I can tell you right now that many of us are already working very deliberately, very intentionally on first mile, last mile aspect. It's a critical piece of the larger uh, program that involves mass transit in a variety of different forms. Um, so we all are already contributing and working in that direction. The key to this really is collaborating, communicating, sharing the ideas, and trying to figure out how we can really come up with that optimum solution. Transit-oriented development is another area that we have taken initiative in. Many of us are working in that direction, have plans to do more in that direction. And thank you for that, but just more specifically, do you think you would see your council voting to contribute dollars towards the transit program, towards Palm Tran? Toward Palm Tran? Mm -hmm. First of all, I'm, I said I wasn't speaking for my council. I would dare not do that. No, I, I, I guess what would your... I mean, I won't be able to go home for Thursday's meeting if I do. <laughs> So um, I understand your question. And insofar as contributions, we can certainly take a quick position of, uh, we provide, that is municipality, 70% of the taxes to operate the county. And one of the, count, one of the most important county, um, county uh, functions and services clearly is um, the uh, Palm Tran function. And we look forward to increasing that, the effectiveness of that in any way we can possibly come up with. But it needs to be an optimum solution, not just piecemeal, not just one issue, but the big picture. Thank you for your insight. Thank you. Thank you. I have Shanna Ostrovitz, followed by Valerie Nielsen, Jonathan Hopkins, Joey Acevedo. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners, and County Administrators. My name is Shana Ostrovitz, and I am the Executive Director of the 1909 Foundation. You may know us as 1909. I'm also here with one of our board members, Ryan Poole. 1909, which was named after the year Palm Beach County was founded, is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the holistic growth of entrepreneurs right here in Palm Beach County. We provide affordable workspace, business education, mentorship, and a vibrant community to over 200 local entrepreneurs and small business owners. I'm sure you all know that small business owners and entrepreneurs are critical to the backbone of our communities. And when money is spent with small business owners and entrepreneurs, much more of it stays right here locally in our communities. Over the past five years, we've been providing local entrepreneurs and small business owners with the resources they need to succeed. We provide access to programming, such as weekly goal setting, expert speakers and mentors, new skills, training, and pitch events. The mentorship programming we offer provides local founders access to the experts they need to support their businesses to move forward. But it also creates a platform for existing and relocating large businesses in the county to invest and give back to the community. We offer a six-month business accelerator program that is designed to help early stage founders develop their ideas into successful businesses. This competitive application-based program welcomes founders each year who are building their companies right here in Palm Beach County. We have helped launch over 100 businesses through this program locally, most of which are women and minority owned. Our focus on supporting women and minority-owned ventures sets us apart from typical business incubators and acceleration programs statewide and nationwide. The most exciting part about all of this is that the businesses we support are thriving. They're creating jobs, they're raising capital, and they're growing. To meet their expanding needs, we have launched scale-up programming to provide resources such as talent recruitment, infrastructure, fundraising, and legal support. Through this programming, we will help more business scale up to their first $1 million in revenue. Our organization has seen tremendous growth in the recent years, and we are now looking to expand our reach throughout the county to create an ecosystem like no other. <clears throat> we are requesting your support to help us expand our reach and support entrepreneurs on a countywide scale. 
to foster economic development, create high paying jobs, and drive new business growth. We will champion inclusivity and diversity in the entrepreneurial community, contributing to a more equitable business landscape. Through this partnership, we can support homegrown startups and small businesses so we don't lose them to other markets. We'll position Palm Beach County as a hub for talent and innovation. Thank you for your time and consideration. Commissioner Bernard, you're recognized. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. I just, uh, Shanna, thanks for the presentation. Yes. Uh, I was looking at, I guess, slide four. Um, on economic development, Ms. Baker, I, it seems that you have like business incentives about 4.3 million. Um, I guess my question is, what are we doing to, to help our small businesses in terms of uh, to continue to make sure that we're growing our small businesses? We are working with our Office of Equal Opportunity with our small businesses. We have a number of uh, not-for-profits that we work with, such as the TED Center that helps with incubators. We also have Runway FAU down runway. in Boca at FAU. So we've got a series of uh, businesses that provide services to our small business. We, could we use more? Absolutely. But we, we currently provide a number of opportunities, such as the BBIC. We just created another program through the BBIC that works with other small women-owned businesses as well. We partnered with Bank of America to make that happen. So I can get you a total list of those businesses, but we're always looking for new partners to help grow our small businesses. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned some of the small some of the other folks that you've worked with and just hearing the presentation and i've had the chance to visit the 1909 uh what i'd love for us to do is if we can work with uh housing economic sustainability if we can see what we can do to work with 1909. uh i know earlier today when we heard the presentation by uh miss jacks you know she talked about how some of the small businesses are really was driving some of the growth, and so whatever we can do to assist, I uh, would definitely would love to do that. Thank you. Vice Mayor, you recognize. Thank you, that was very good, Commissioner Bernard. Ms. Uh, Baker, do we work with this foundation? I have not had the opportunity to work with 1909 at this point, um, but we will be meeting with them and, and vetting them and working uh, moving forward. Um, again, we'll be coming back to the board because <laughs> <No. laughs> that wasn't included. Uh, and so we'll see where we go from there. What I would like to do is, um, <clears throat> I think I worked with your foundation for preparing students for um, applications for jobs and, and how that worked out. So uh, contact us and contact my office as well. Small business is a backbone of Palm Beach County. We could certainly use that's a good stimulus for uh, revenue, streams of revenue for all of us. So definitely make sure you contact all the commissioners and make sure you knock on my door. Absolutely, Thanks. will do. Commissioner Baxter, you're recognized. Thank you, Commissioner, or excuse me, Vice Mayor Sachs, and also, and she did say all of us, I would be very interested in setting up a meeting with you. So if you could at least leave us your contact information and we'll set a meeting. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. I actually have a one pager, am I able to? Hand that to. Right there? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Nielsen. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Valerie Nielsen. I'm the executive director at the Palm Beach Transportation Planning Agency. Uh, my comment today is uh, in regards to Palm Tran. As you consider the budget, I want to echo some of the comments we've heard today. It is a very exciting time. We're experiencing a lot of economic development, a lot of growth. In fact, we're expecting another million people in this urbanized area that we share with Broward and Miami-Dade County over the next 25 years. So as we're planning into the future, um, we really now is the time to invest in transit, but really revamp our current system to uh, make it more efficient, encourage ridership, because we are running out of public right-of-way. So I encourage the commission to um, direct Palm Tran to revamp their system, look for efficiencies, 
uh, repurpose funds for areas that are not performing well, that are ex services that are expensive and maybe not the best use of the funds, and really invest in that transit ridership. Um, we heard about some pilot express routes. The TPA can prioritize capital dollars. In fact, we've prioritized $26 million over the next five years for electric buses, enhanced transit shelters, transit single priority, and other technologies. However, we can't uh, prioritize operations and maintenance. If this county were to have, if the voters if and when um, we do have a dedicated uh, countywide funding source for operations and maintenance, we would be eligible for so much more investment and funding at the federal level. Broward and Miami-Dade counties have passed that ballot. They do have a funding source for transportation that includes operations and maintenance for transit. Um, but I just, want, I just want to make that statement and encourage all of you to really think about transit. We are the most expensive area, um, one of the most expensive areas for housing and transportation costs. It's not affordable. It's not going to get better. Transit is access to opportunity, education, health care, um, and all of the above. So thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Hopkins. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Commission. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Hopkins, the Acting Executive Director of uh, the West Palm Beach Mobility Coalition, uh, known as WPBGO. Uh, we represent a growing public-private partnership between local government and lo well-known local businesses working on improving access and mobility to our region's largest job center. As our business-led mobility coalition has the following recommendations related to funding of transit and tra transportation in our county. Uh, number one is that business success in Palm Beach County requires increased funding of transit, not decreases to it. As we've heard all about how fast our region is growing, uh, the only way we can effectively deal with that is by increases. The BDB would notes to, uh, to many of us that the number one issue that employers coming to our county or interested in coming to our county voice is how are people going to get to work? So that's a major issue in growing jobs. The other pieces of affordability that uh, Valerie just mentioned. At 60% of income, that's what our residents spend on housing plus transportation. We're the most expensive place to live in the country. And the reason is because people have to live far from where they work and they have to drive to where they get there for most of them because for many people transit isn't an option because we don't have a, good, uh, a robust enough transit system. And so we are spending in many cases double the proportion of income on transportation in this county than many other places in the country. And the solution to that is, is better transit. Um, but that, that cost is actually $10,000 a year for every car that we own. That's about $40 a day for a commuting day that people are spending to own a, the car. Provision of transit costs people about $6 a ride. It is actually the cheapest way to get people around and the riders are paying for one third of that. For transit to be a viable option <clears throat> for workers, it needs to be fast, frequent and have direct routes. Um, I was at a, a county that's one quarter this size and found that they had seven routes that are on 10 minute headways, another 13 miles of corridors that have 10 minute headways. That's how you give people like the freedom of frequency that you get choice riders on transit. Every person that we get on transit on a bus is one less bumper in front of those people that have to drive everywhere. There's a lot of talk uh, at this commission about the proportional cost spent on paratransit at 26%. Some people might say that uh, that means that you need to cut paratransit. I think there'd be a lot of people in this room that say, really, please don't. Um, the more likely answer is that we're just not spending enough on our fixed route service that our fixed route service is so small and minimal that um, some people could actually use even the ADA service of fixed route services that's, again, $6 a rider instead of over $50 a rider. Um, so we really need to look at that. Long term, we need to look at provision of actual, actual mass transit. A light rail train coming every four minutes carries the same amount of people as 20 freeway lanes. A BRT line is the same as five or six freeway lanes. Those freeway lanes are very, very expensive. When we provide mass transit, then people can live closer to work. We can build tall buildings closer and on corridors like Okeechobee and SR7. And that gives people the freedom to not have to spend $40 a day on a car. Um, finally, we have businesses that are ready to invest and partner uh, to buy transit passes for all their employees. So that's a goal that we have. We thank you for your time and appreciate your effort on this. Thank you. Sir? Thank you, uh, Board of County Commissioners, Vice Mayor and Mayor, and Mr. Virginia Baker. My name is Joey Acevedo and I'm a Palm Tran operator, and I'm also the vice chair of the Palm Tran Service Board, and I stand before you as your constituent to please support this bill. Palm Tran has been very vital to our community. I think that, you know, if we don't have a vital transportation system, we don't have a city. I think that um, Palm Tran has provided excellent customer service, excellent service with it was in power transit. I think that in, when, when Cotran came, became Palm Tran, that was the only time in 1996 that Palm Tran expanded their routes. And on 20, in 2016, 
when Mr. Forbes came in was the time when they did an RPM where they, they didn't grow. Mr. Forbes and his team got together and said, we're gonna take some routes that are not performing well and realign some of these routes to make the routes perform even better. They even inaligned certain buses to, uh, to save more money and save buses on the route. So I would urge you to please think about this, uh, the budget meeting because if we do cut back on service, this could lead to job layoffs, probably about maybe 20 to 20 to 25 employees and we don't wanna do that. We don't want, to, this would be a de detriment to our community. So I, I hope you, thank you, support this service. Thank you. Uh, Marcos Rodriguez followed by Rafael Clemente, and that's those are the last two cards. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me on, and giving me this platform um, to speak to you. I am a fixed route driver for Palm Tran, as well as a union rep. Um, I drive the Route 40 in the morning, and I drive the 62 in the afternoon. And what I'll tell you is that there are there's ridership. Before COVID, we saw, or at least, well, we saw a rise in ridership. And then after COVID, it just seems like we just didn't have our footing and it's starting to catch up now. I'm seeing the ridership. Um, and if the benchmark is, is that you guys want to become a, you know, a major city, uh, you know, see, you know, growth and development, there's no way to do that without transportation. Fixed route is vital. There's no way to do that. Um, the, the ridership is growing, is what I can tell you. And I've driven vast amount of routes. Are there deficiencies? Yeah. Are they, is there room for efficiency? Absolutely. But I've always worked closely with planning and with Mr. Forbes' team to voice our opinions and to make this system better. That's what my goal is as a steward to this county, representing you all. With that, I thank you for this platform. Thank you, Ms. Virginia Baker. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clemente. Good afternoon, or, or almost evening, Mayor, Council, Commission, I should say. Rafael Clemente, I'm the Executive Director of the West Palm Beach Downtown Development Authority, and I am here tonight, like so many others, speaking in support of funding for Palm Tran, your regional transit agency. Uh, downtown is uh, the region's greatest concentration of jobs with about 35,000 jobs today and more on the way. Many of those jobs are wage earners. They're coming from all over our region to, the, to your, your county's uh, heart here. We have about 10,000 residents also growing. Um, our downtown core is blessed by uh, being the greatest concentration of regional connection in, our, in the South Florida region. We have Brightline, we have Tri-Rail, and of course we have Palm Tran with the main intermodal facility, uh, facility here in downtown. But we could do so much better for our county by connecting better to the core. Um, we've heard so many people have spoken before me. I actually edited my comments, not to be redundant. Um, but what I've heard on the, from the dais, um, uh, your, our challenges we know are affordability. We know transit is a key that unlocks that for us. We know our challenge uh, as a county is the cost of building and maintaining roads. Transit is also a key that unlocks solutions for that. Um, and then uh, it was, I was uh, very interested to hear uh, uh, Councilman Mara speak about what local uh, organizations, local municipalities can do. Um, and working very closely with the city of West Palm Beach and as a special district serving the downtown, I'll share with you what we've been able to do as uh, a potential model for success. Year over year, we have invested more and more in transportation options within the downtown region, and every year we see an increase in people choosing those options. Not just fixed route, we've also gone to on-demand service um, within the downtown core. In uh, about a 16-month period, we saw a 1,000% increase in ridership on a, a downtown uh, free shuttle program. Convenience and affordability are the ways to make it happen. Uh, and I believe that um, now is the time. If we, if we think we're gonna build our way out of congestion with more roads, uh, that is a downward spiral for us. So I hope that you will consider additional funding, not just keeping it uh, where it is, but increasing uh, the funding for transit in the region. And, I, and we will reap the benefits of that. Thank you very much. 
pardon me, we also have um, three non-speaking cards. Uh, one is support of Palm Tran and the other two are please support animal care and control. And that's it. All right, thank you very much. All right, um, bringing this back to the board. Um, first, well, before I do that, I just wanna thank the members of the public that were here this afternoon uh, for sharing uh, their thoughts regarding our budget with us. So thank you for being here and your comments. I'll bring this back to the board. I don't see any other lights lit. Um, I wanna thank our staff um, for preparing uh, the budget. This uh, it was very informative. We will obviously, we have a lot to digest and uh, has given, given you some uh, directions as well. So we look forward to coming back together uh, in July, if not sooner. Uh, for this continued conversation. With that, I don't see anything else. Um, this, is there any uh, commissioner comments? I don't, I wanna make sure everybody has an opportunity. Don't see any? Okay, with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much. I wanna thank our staff for being here as well to be ready to answer any questions that might be.